Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our Bible talk for this week. The subject is going to be the art of creation. It's uh, nice of you to join us um, to listen to it. Our presentation is going to be given to us by Mark Lucas. Creation is one of my favourite subjects, really. There's so much in it to enjoy and to, to learn from. The other day, even, we went for a short walk up in the foothills, not far from our house, and it was amazing to see all the autumn leaves and the, the various colours. In fact, we were quite lucky. We saw in the space of 15 minutes an echidna, three koalas, a number of kangaroos. It's funny, there's four kangaroos running down a hill closely being chased by a fox. I think it's not chased, but to closely follow it anyway. But yeah, it was wonderful stuff, all part of the artistry of creation, which Mark is going to investigate further with us tonight. But because this is a, a Bible talk, we're first going to open with a word of prayer. A great and almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all living things, you who knows all things and can do all, we come before you to praise you and to thank you for your great and amazing works. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for the Bible and the hope you've given us through it. And as we come tonight to learn from it, we pray for your guidance and direction that we might be able to grow in your ways, to see how you've worked in the world and the, the hope you've given to us all. So please be with us all and watch over us, we pray, and direct us in all we do. We come before you now through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now to introduce Mark's talk tonight, he's asked that we take a short reading from the Bible, and that is going to be from Job chapter 38. I'll just read that for you, from Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come, but no further, and here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place? It might take hold of the ends of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it. It takes on form like clay under a seal, and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? Had the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? In darkness, where is its place? That ye may take it to its territory, that ye may know the path to its home. Do you know because you were born then, or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow, or have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, the day of battle and war? By what way is light diffused? 
or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel to the overflowing water, or a path for the thunderbolt, to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? And the frost of heaven, who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind a cluster of the Pelades, or loose the belt of the Orient? Can you bring out Mazaroth in its season? Or can you guide the great bear with its cuffs? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set the dominion over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Or who can pour out the bottles of heaven? And the dust hardens in clumps, and the clods cling together. Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? When they crouch in their dens, or lurk in their lairs to lie in wait, who provides food for the raven, when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? So with that reading as an introduction, we'll then hand over to Mark, who's going to talk to the subject of the art of creation. Well, good evening, brothers and sisters, young people and friends, and thanks for listening in tonight, uh, wherever you may be under these exceptional circumstances. As our chairman has already mentioned, we're going to be considering the art of creation tonight. It's a slightly different topic to the usual discussions that we have around the subject of creation. Normally, we would want to talk about creation from what we're told about in the first few chapters of Genesis. And although we're going to be going back to these chapters to have a look through some of the step-by-step -step details of creation, our purpose tonight is not so much to establish um, the facts of creation, which we already believe to be true, but to explore the creative or artistic way in which everything we know has been brought into being. And our reason for doing this tonight is to demonstrate that everything that we see in the creative world is not the result of a highly statistically improbable series of chance events that current scientific theories would have us believe, but rather the result of careful planning incredibly detailed design and a wonderfully creative and artistic mind that demonstrates an appreciation of physically and emotionally beautiful objects and concepts. And I hope to look at this concept of beauty from a scriptural viewpoint briefly tonight as well. Now I'd like to put it right out there to start with that I am no art aficionado, I'm not an art professional, I have no artistic qualifications. I like to think that I'm mildly creative by nature, but I'm, I'm sure there are many listeners tonight who have far greater artistic flair and an appreciation for artistic and creative concepts than myself. But I also don't think that that is necessary for what we want to consider tonight, because we are going to be able to gather enough information from the scripture, from, natural, uh, from the natural world, uh, in the short space of time that we have tonight to see evidence of a creative power far more complex, far more intelligent and considered than evolution gives it credit for. Now, if I were to go into an art gallery, which admittedly is a fairly infrequent event, I couldn't give you a dissertation on a particular painting or a sculpture. As I've said, I'm, I'm no expert on the subject. However, I have met very few people who go into these places, into art galleries and similar places, who can't express an opinion or feeling about the art that they see. I don't know an awful lot about art, but I know what I like because I can appreciate 
the creativity and the skill with which the artist has used to depict some scenery or tell a story. And this really brings us to the purpose of art. If we want to consider how art has played any part in creation, in God's creation, we first need to understand what the purpose of art is and whether that purpose has been considered and any artistic techniques that have been used during the process of the creation as we understand it. So if we have a look at our first slide tonight, we can see a couple of definitions of art which give us an indication of its purpose. The Cambridge definition for art is the making of objects, images, music, etc. that are beautiful or that express feelings. If you were to ask Wikipedia for a definition of art, it would tell you that art is a diverse range of human activities in creating visual, auditory or performing artefacts, that is artworks, expressing the author's imaginative, conceptual ideas or technical skill, intended to be appreciated for their beauty or their emotional power. Art is primarily categorised into three classical branches. It includes painting, sculpture and architecture. So both definitions are fairly consistent in their meaning. Creative works that are beautiful or express feelings and emotions. There are also well-established fundamental principles and elements that go along with an understanding of art, which we'll see in our next slide. The key principles of art include movement, unity, harmony, variety, balance, contrast, proportion and pattern. We also have some key elements of art and they include texture, form, space, shape, colour, value and line. So here we already have some helpful tools to enable us to begin to identify art and the key principles and elements that are used, that are employed to create a thing of beauty or something that conveys emotion. So what, what we want to do is have a look at some famous works of art uh, and we want to see how they have used these techniques to capture this idea of beauty. Now I'd just like to add that um, all of these images that I'm about to show you tonight have been sourced from Wikipedia, which provides these images for use under a Creative Commons license. So no infringement or copyright infringement has been intended. Now our next slide shows some paintings by the famous 19th century Impressionist painter Claude Monet. And these paintings form a small part, just a small part of his Haystack series. It was called his Haystack series. And this series is famous for the way in which Monet repeated the same subject over and over again to show the differing light and the atmosphere and the different times of day across seasons and in different types of weather. Now, I'm not going to provide an art lecture for every painting that we're going to have a look at tonight, but you can see that he has use the principles and elements that we spoke about earlier. He's certainly used variety, as we can see in these, in these four paintings of the 25 in the series. He's used balance and proportion. He's used contrast in light. He's used space in those images that we see. He's used colours, vibrant colours, and he's used form to create these beautiful paintings. In fact, the thing that I appreciate most about these paintings, particularly uh, the painting on the top right, is how he has captured the light. It looks, like, it looks like the last light of the day. It looks so realistic. And we've all seen uh, sunsets or sunrises like that and the colours and the shadows that it produces. And paintings like this make us think about these moments. And they are, they're very beautiful. They're, they're, they're extremely beautiful. They can produce emotion responses in the viewer um, when, they, when they look at these paintings and they think about these circumstances where they've seen them in real life. So what I take from this painting is an, appreci an appreciation of beautiful scenery that has been expertly captured on canvas by a master painter uh, who has an intimate understanding and a passion for the subject that he has just recreated. Let's have a look at one more painting briefly by the, um, the German-American painter Albert Bierstadt. And it's a painting of a scene from the American Rocky Mountains. 
And once again, we can see from the painting that the artist has used contrast in both light and form. He has utilized space and proportion and shape uh, to, to recreate a beautiful wilderness scene that engages the viewer and it draws their, their gaze past the, the peaceful foreground up into the untamed and the majestic mountains that we see in that, in that image. So once again, a beautiful recreation of natural scenery by a very talented, gifted and skillful artist. And we accept that fact unequivocally, don't we? That these artworks were executed with such precision and skill by the hands of artists. And yet a lot of the world today disregard out of hand the possibility, or dare I say, the obvious conclusion that everything we see in the natural world around us was also created by an artist. The greatest artist to ever exist, who still exists, who is constantly creating works of art. These few paintings that we have looked at so far are only a few of the myriad of the works by the hands of gifted men and women who have attempted to recreate uh, what we see in nature. And the key to note here is, well, the key word is recreate. You see, most art is a recreation of real life, a sculpture of a historical character, a painting of a, of a few haystacks here and there in a field. But few people stop to think about the original artists of, of those scenes. And I have been very careful to make sure that any copies of paintings I show you tonight are free from copyright infringement. How many artists in history do you think paid any recognition to the original author of their works? Why does society find it so easy to accept the skill of artists that recreate these amazing scenes, but do not recognize the master craftsman and skilled being that created these, re these scenes in real life to begin with? He has used the same techniques. In fact, he created those techniques. He has perfected the use of movement, perfected the use of unity and harmony. It was how God created everything in the beginning that we read of in Genesis chapter 1. We read in Genesis chapter 1 that God saw that everything was good, everything he created was good, it was beautiful. He created that in the beginning. And his creation that we see in the natural world is the greatest display of variety, balance and contrast of anything known to mankind. The proportions that we see throughout his creation are perfect as well. This is evident in the case of how our own planet is placed at the perfect position in the universe to sustain life. Not too hot, not too cold, just the right amount of light, just the right size and the perfect shape. A perfectly balanced creation. At least that was how God created it in the beginning. It's under the control of humanity and it has become less balanced than it was originally intended to. But my point is that all around us we can see these same principles, the fundamental artistic principles in the natural world, in the created natural world around us. And the key elements of art are all around us, which mankind for thousands of years has replicated in their own artwork. And yet there is still debate that the beauty we witness all around us is the result of a series of chance events or a fluke of evolution. Just think about this for a moment. The paintings that we've looked at have captured one beautiful, thought-provoking moment in time. But they are static images, a still visual depiction of real life. But the world is not like that, is it? The world around us and the universe we live in is a dynamic environment. There is very little that is still about the world that we live in. God has created an amazing real life masterpiece so we can appreciate its dynamic and changing beauty and marvel at the skill of the one who created it. Let's have a look at our reading tonight, Job chapter 38. We've already had a, a, a read through Job 38, so what we'll do is just pick out some of the language that we picked up here in our reading that we, we read at the beginning of our evening. Look at the language that God uses here in Job 38. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined its measurements? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? You know, this really gets the mind going, doesn't it? Who shut the sea with doors? Who prescribed limits for it that it would only come so far 
and no further? Have you commanded the morning since your days began, caused uh, the dawn to know its place? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? God is not just a conceptual artist here, is he? He is the chief architect. He has considered the expanse of the universe and its, its proportions. But he's also the principal engineer. He has contemplated the superstructure of the earth itself and how it is suspended in space. He has laid the foundations of it. God's also the cunning craftsman who has fashioned everything to a precise tolerance and created every living and inanimate thing in beauty. This concept of beauty in itself is a, is a fascinating subject. Why is it that we as humans appreciate beautiful things, things that have been crafted by skillful hands, beautiful natural scenery, beautiful music, beautiful buildings, poetry that conveys so accurately the feelings of the heart. Why do we appreciate and crave these things as humans? They give us little advantage as living beings. You know, the, the principles of evolution would have us believe that species adopt physical and behavioural changes and, and attributes that give a species an advantage that allow it to survive in its environment or to compete with other life forms. But no other life form has an inherent inbuilt appreciation for beauty and artistic form simply for the purpose of pleasure. Sure, people can teach apes and elephants to paint. There are beautiful birds in Papua New Guinea that decorate, uh, decorate their nests for the purposes of attracting a mate. But these are either learned skills that have been taught to them by humans or instincts that serve a purpose uh, and enable that creature to produce offspring. And it also illustrates the amazing creation of God in giving these animals, these creatures, these abilities to be able to do this, learned abilities um, to be able to, to, to produce these works of, of art that have been taught to them by humans. But there's little correlation between those examples and why we as humans love and appreciate these things so much. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that we have been created in the image and the likeness of the angels, the agents of God's creative power that perform his will. That's why it says in verse 26 of Genesis 1, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The angels who have performed the will of God in creating all things also have an appreciation and a love for things of beauty. And Genesis tells us that we have been created in the same likeness. We have been created to appreciate and love these things just as the angels and just like God does. The very first chapter even describes God's pleasure in his act of creation. All through Genesis 1, we read that God completes his work and he is satisfied with it. Verse 4, verse 10, verse 18, verse 25 and 31 all tell us that God takes pleasure from the beauty of his creation. So that's where you from Genesis chapter 1, verse 15 to 19. Genesis 1, verse 15 to 19. God is talking about the, uh, the creation of, of the lights to govern the heavens here. He says in verse 15, Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So God views his creation after he has, uh, he has made it and sees that it's good. The original Hebrew word that is used here is the word tov, and it means good in the widest possible sense. It means to be something to be pleasing or beautiful. God has intentionally created a beautiful environment for mankind to inhabit and to appreciate and to glorify him for his work of creation. And I can't help uh, thinking after reading verses 15 to 19, after God has created the sun and the moon uh, to divide light from day, that he would have been looking at a scene similar to the one on our next slide. 
when he pronounced that uh, it was beautiful, it was good. So how many, how many times have you stopped at a beach in an attempt to capture the changing light of a beautiful sunset like the one on the sea here? It changes by the second, doesn't it? It's, it's impossible to capture the full extent of its beauty in one photograph. God's creation is a dynamic and changing work of art. It's repeated every day and filled with wonderful patterns, light and movement. And we appreciate it and it stirs emotions within us as it does with God because we are created in his image and likeness. Let's have a look at another example of God's appreciation for art in scripture back in the Old Testament. We want to have a look at the similarities between God and man and God having made man with the same creative capacity as himself to create beautiful things. We want to see hopefully in some small way that being made in God's image and likeness with this love of art, this love and appreciation of beautiful things, is further proof that we are just a smaller expression of God's own creativity, which he has put, intentionally put, into the hearts of men. Let's have a look at Exodus 35, verse 30, where God gives instruction uh, for the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Actually, I've got that up on the screen. I'll read that for you. Uh, then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and has filled him with the spirit of God and with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamak of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. What an amazing account that is. Look at what God has given instruction for here. Men of intelligence, wisdom, with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in many different materials in every skilled craft, but not only to work in these crafts, but to teach them to others. God filled these men with artistic abilities to produce a place of worship where they would meet with their God. Creative ability is a gift from God. Look at what it says there. The Lord has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs. Man has not devised anything in his own right or any original work that has not been given to him by God, either by way of inspiration or skill. And this is further evidence that God is the author of all creation. Man has been created in God's image and after his likeness. Man creates because God put that mind in him. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time looking at another aspect of God's creation, uh, his artistic creation, which is also a common feature in art. And that is the technique of repetition. We've already looked at this idea briefly with some of the paintings that we've seen earlier. And the same subject, haystacks, that were used with, with slight variation in light, perspective and season and, and so on. Now, variation is closely related to repetition. And I'd like to draw an example um, from uh, Charles Darwin's book, Origin of the Species. I don't want to uh, dwell on it too much because this is supposed to be a talk about art and creation, uh, not a debate between evolution and creation. But I do believe it illustrates a point about repetition and variation in nature. And I believe art can provide a very simple answer to this question in that book that he attempts to explain uh, the existence of the vast array of similar creatures in the world by saying that they evolved over a very long period of time by means of natural selection, by environmental changes and competition with other species. Uh, not to mention he's also dedicated a, a whole chapter in his book entitled Difficulties on the Theory. Uh, this is obviously an attempt to explain gaps in his theory where there's an absence in the geological record of the missing links between 
these different groups of varied species. So very simply, the idea of natural selection, as, as uh, Mr. Darwin would have us believe, is that very small physical and behavioural changes in species occur over a very long period of time as a result of environmental adaptation and competition. Um, it leads to a species evolving into a more developed species because they have developed an advantage over their predecessor. So over a long period of time, we end up with very similar species of birds with longer beaks, some with shorter beaks. We've got multiple species of similar looking turtles. We have iguanas that swim in water as opposed to their land dwelling cousins who don't swim. Many repetitions of a similar species of animal that, although they're similar, they are in fact different species or subspecies and have been categorised as, as different species. So there is, there is lots of variation and repetition in the natural world that science has tried to tell us is the result of, of natural selection. Although if you care to read chapter 6 in Charles Darwin's book, you'll find it rather convoluted and, and filled with speculation about those ideas. If, on the other hand, we look at the natural world as part of God's artistic creation, the puzzle pieces, in my opinion, begin to fit a lot easier. Let's have a look at another slide of some paintings to illustrate this point. These paintings that we see on the slide are some oil paintings, which you may recognise as some of the more famous works of the 19th century Dutch painter, Vincent van Gogh, or van Gogh, however you wish to pronounce it. And both of these paintings are painted by the same man in very similar styles, with very similar brush strokes, very similar sceneries, very similar colours. Now, I don't want to go into the extraordinary stories that these paintings were intended to tell the viewer, but suffice it to say that these, these type of paintings with swirling brush strokes and, and darker colours give an indication of the turbulent state of mind of Van Gogh at the time. Once again, art has been used to convey emotion and feeling. That was very much the case with, with Vincent when he painted a lot of his paintings. Now, you don't have to be an art dealer when you're looking at these two paintings to tell that they've been produced by the same man. He didn't sign all of his paintings, but if his signature wasn't on the painting, it's fairly easy to tell the artist uh, for both paintings is the same person. Same idea with the Monet haystacks we looked at earlier. If you take the artist away, the paintings, tell, uh, paintings themselves bear all the hallmarks of the man who painted them. And they repeat themselves an awful lot. You know, Van Gogh created over 2,000 works of art in his life, and there were a lot of, a lot of vases of sunflowers that he painted uh, in, in that number of, of artworks. And they all looked very similar, ever so slightly different, uh, each one of them. Humankind has never had any trouble associating all of these works with Vincent van Gogh, with the same man. But in the case of the natural world and everything that we see around us, when we have 50 different species of birds or apes that, that look similar, but are ever so slightly different, the race is on to prove that anything but an immensely talented and divine artist was responsible for it. If you remove the artist from the equation, you can come up with any theory as to how two similar works of art came into being. Extremely complex and highly improbable theories of that. And Mr. Darwin has gone to great lengths in his book to attempt to confound or impress his audience with the complexity of his theories, rather than accept the simple solution that all of these similar creatures with slight variations in the natural world were created by the one cunning artist who loves beauty and variety and repetition, just like the artist that we have considered tonight, which he has also created. Now, I'd like to finish on my last point, but by far the most important, and it has to do with the purpose of God's creation and what his estimation of beauty and pleasantness is. Let's have a look at the quote uh, on our next slide. Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So 
So we are part of God's creation. We read that earlier in Genesis. Much like a painting or a sculpture gives glory or praise to its creator, the purpose of humanity is to give glory to God and praise to God. Now we only do that when we reflect what our creator desires to see in us. Much like an artist is praised for his works when he accurately depicts what he intended to in that painting, in that sculpture. But the difference between ourselves and paintings is that God does not see beauty in the same way that we do. You see, as people, we often judge beauty and pleasantness by external factors, by the things that we see, by the things that we hear, what we can touch. But this is not how God measures beauty or the things that he loves, the things that he holds in high regard. Let's have a look at another quote on our next slide. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So this is quite interesting because this idea has nothing to do with any visual beauty, does it? God loves those who do righteous deeds. Why? Well, because he is righteous. And this thought is picked up in, in the second quote on that slide in 1 Peter 1 verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, I'd like to look at another quote from Exodus chapter 33. Um, and this quote in Exodus chapter 33 um, is just after God has brought the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. They find themselves in... Um, in the wilderness led by Moses, who we are told in the book of Numbers, was very meek, meek above all the people which were on the face of the earth. And God chose a man who had very little self-pride to lead his people into the promised land. And once again, it's interesting to note the, the personal attributes and characteristics that God places value on in a leader that are completely different to what men would value. You see, in Exodus chapter 33, Moses asks God, and he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God says to Moses, he says, I will show you my glory. You won't see my face because no man can see the face of God and live. But I will make all my goodness pass before you, Moses, and I will proclaim my name before you. And this is what God reveals to Moses in Exodus 34, verse 6, in the next slide. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now, I have no doubt there were there was some visual spectacle involved uh, in this event that Moses witnessed. But the most important thing to note here is that the things that God has revealed to Moses about himself are not they're not physical or visual attributes. They are God's character. They are the fundamental aspects of who he is at his core. And just as important as this, as this, as God's creation, we are called to be like him. We have been made in his image and in his likeness. He has called us to be righteous and holy as he is. And this requires input from us, doesn't it? And this is what separates us from the rest of creation. He hasn't called any other creatures from his creation to be like him. But he has called us to be like him in character. Now this, this adds a challenge because it, 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 there's, an, there's an unexpected layer of complexity to this work of art that we are all supposed to be. But God does not expect us to develop these attributes alone. If he's given us a template, a guide on which we can trace or model our own lives to become more like him. And that template is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, we are told that God in the last days, which we live, has spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things. And verse 3 tells us that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he himself had purged sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The template we have to follow in developing God's beauty, God's glory, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the perfect 
manifestation or replication of God's character in mankind. Not only that, but God provided his son as a sacrifice, as it says in Hebrews, to purge our sins as human humankind and human nature dictates that we sin. And this is the this is the purpose or sorry, the cause of, of the death of, of man. This is the ultimate cause of man's downfall. And this is the message of the gospel that the Bible preaches, which we would encourage all people to search out for themselves in what we believe to be the very last days before the return of Jesus Christ back to the earth to fulfill God's purpose, to establish his kingdom and to rid the world of sin. Two final quotes. The first quote speaks about this gospel message that I have uh, just mentioned. The message of salvation through Jesus Christ and hope of God's kingdom on earth in the age to come. This is God's estimation of beauty. Romans 10 verse 15. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God truly does see beauty on another level from us. He values the beauty of those who preach the gospel message of salvation because God so loved the world that he gave his son that we might have salvation from sin and death. God wants so very much every person in the world to have this opportunity of salvation that is extended. he's extended to them. Um, and, and he ascribes beauty to this process. This is what God sees as beautiful. This is the things that God holds dear. Now, last quote gives us a tantalizing hint and leaves our imaginations hanging at what God has prepared for his servants. And so we implore you to search out this gospel message, recognizing that we are God's creation. He wants every person in this world to develop the beautiful aspects of his character that he has revealed to us in his word, in his word. That as it is written. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That is truly a wonderful time that we all look forward to and we encourage you all to search these things out for yourself that you may uh, find the things uh, concerning salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Paul, well, on behalf of you all, I'd like to thank Mark for his words to us tonight. Indeed, he's shown to us that creation around us indeed hasn't just happened by chance but it's the amazing work of a, a God and creator who has created all this all this for which we enjoy and indeed he's given us a hope too for the future which we can be part of so thank you Mark for your words tonight um, there will be a further address next Sunday uh, the subject on that occasion will be the significance of Israel's independence. So that will be another subject worth listening to, and uh, we encourage you to uh, to have a look at uh, that topic next Sunday as well. If you are looking for more uh, information on the Bible and uh, and further talks, we encourage you to look up thisisyourbible.com website. There you'll find uh, a website with uh, different topics uh, which you can explore. So thank you once more for joining us. And we're going to close uh, this evening in the word of prayer. Thanking God for the time we have. Our loving and gracious and wise God, we come before you knowing that you are the only God. We are in wonder and awe of your ways. Do we thank you for the time we've had this night to examine your message contained in the Bible, to learn of the great things you've performed, indeed to see your great work of creation which is all around us. We know you are the only God, the only creator. Indeed, we thank you for looking down on us and giving us hope, giving us a direction in life which we can follow. Indeed, please be with our endeavours to learn about your ways and how we should serve you. Indeed, 
In our separate circumstances, please watch over us all and direct us as we know our needs and what is best. So we thank you for all you have done now. Ask this prayer for our Lord Jesus Christ. 